Well, good morning, everybody. Thank you all for coming. Um, my name is Sam Shamimi. I'm the Deputy for uh, International Space Station here at headquarters. And it's my pleasure this morning to introduce Dr. Jesko von Putkamer. Uh, he started his career at uh, NASA in 1962 at the Marshall Space Flight Center uh, when Dr. Uh, Werner von Braun brought him over from Germany. Uh, he worked on the Apollo program. It was essential in the propulsion area. And he also worked Skylab. And he's also, as you can tell by this presentation today, has worked for many years on uh, missions beyond the Earth and beyond the moon and, and especially to Mars. Uh, he has quite a bit of experience around the agency, including dealing with the, with, with the Russians. He's the author of many books. He's consulted on many movies and series. In fact, the first Star Trek series he consulted on that. <laughs> yeah, I had to mention that. <laughs> uh, uh, so um, I think that's about it. He started here at headquarters in 1974, uh, and he's worked uh, several positions, including um, uh, mission planning uh, and as well as International Space Station program. So please welcome Jesko von Putkamer. Okay. Thank you very much. <coughs> that's a nice uh, painting there by Pat Rawlings, and uh, it's really a photograph. And you kind of see uh, uh, three persons there. You don't fortunately see whether they are male or female. Uh, there must be at least one female in there. And one is an American. In the middle there is Asa. And on the right side is a Russian. And uh, the person who took that photo is a Chinese. <laughs> anyway, <coughs> I, gave <coughs> I gave this presentation a few weeks ago in uh, Huntsville at the International Space Development Conference there. And, uh, some people later on asked me to do it again here at headquarters. And you'll be amazed, uh, or some of you, uh, but uh, how much effort uh, has already gone into piloted Mars mission studies in, the, in those uh, 60 years. Uh, there have been countless studies, uh, both uh, NASA internal and uh, contracted by NASA with industry and also by external groupings. Uh, I can hint only on a few of them, on the major studies, and, and kind of at the end come up with some <coughs> concluding uh, remarks. A full text uh, of my uh, study is available and on demand, and I can also provide copies of all the slides, and I understand they are recording uh, my uh, valuable words right now uh, uh, on video. Um, Okay, let's get started. Where is that? P ah, here. Uh, this here. This is uh, what we're talking about. Mars, fourth uh, planet from the sun, further away from the sun than the Earth is, and a great attractor because it's been fascinating uh, mankind since the early, uh, you know, early antiquity. Uh, it's caused the myth and legends and religions and uh, astrological uh, definitions to come about. Um, it became a person, uh, a godlike person, a god of uh, war, of fire, of uh, uh, harvesting, of fertility, and of course also of macho uh, uh, masculinity. <coughs> Uh, today we know it's a planet and it's the, uh, really a neighbor to Earth. It's the closest uh, planet on which we could uh, build up an, a settlement eventually. Um, it has uh, resources, lots of resources. We know now today it has water, even liquid water it looks like. And it uh, therefore means uh, it could have uh, had life or it may actually have life in a microbial form. So it's been uh, a great attractor for science and, of course, for the general public. Uh, countless science fiction stories have been uh, written about it. It's um, a focus of pop culture. Re just remember Orson Welles uh, and his uh, Mars panic he caused with his radio um, uh, message one day. And uh, so uh, no wonder that uh, people have been asking, well, can we go there one day ourselves? Uh, originally, oops, 
No, I want to wanna go the other way. Okay, uh, astronomers uh, with their uh, inferior telescopes uh, saw these types of pictures. This one comes from Giovanni Schiaparelli, 1877, uh, who thought he saw uh, uh, straight lines on Mars, which he in Italian called canali. And that was later mistranslated uh, in it to mean, uh, you know, water channels. Uh, he really meant grooves. And uh, therefore, with some other people seeing the same thing, um, uh, Percival Lowell, for example, uh, the uh, legend or the expectation that there actually may be life on, Earth, on Mars and lots of water came about. Uh, in addition, uh, you could see seasonal changes. You, s you saw the uh, darkening areas uh, lightening up again, uh, the poles, the polar caps, changed their sizes and so people thought that the Mars was a quite a livable planet uh, but what really uh, turned out uh, in uh, 1965 is what you see in the upper right corner when Mariner 4, uh, the first uh, probe uh, from Earth, uh, flew by Mars and took the first picture and one of the first pictures is up here in the corner. It shows just a cratered surface and no uh, straight lines uh, no uh, ground cover, no plant life, no animals, no signs of uh, intelligence uh, having dark water channels and so on. So uh, Mariner 4 to a lot of people was a great disappointment who had actually uh, put in their imagination much more into Mars than actually was there. Uh, later on Mariner 9 became the first orbiter uh, in 1971, it still is there, Mariner 9 is still orbiting Mars, and it uh, brought a survey, uh, a whole series of uh, uh, pictures back which showed us that Mars still was very interesting, that uh, Mariner 4 saw only a, a, a small piece of it, and that there are many, many interesting things and, and uh, puzzles and uh, miracle type things on Mars. Mars is so much smaller than Earth, but it's got the biggest mountain in the whole solar system. And uh, it's got uh, this Valles Marineris, the biggest canyon in the solar system, much larger than anything we have on Earth or anywhere else. So all of those questions uh, still have not, have not been fully answered by science, and so scientists are very interested in getting there. Uh, in situ themselves, not just do a remote uh, reconnaissance, which is pretty good if you want to uh, get a kind of a localized uh, uh, yeah, a data, uh, but if you want a global view of the whole planet, you either have to launch very, very many unmanned probes or take a human there uh, who can then uh, start exploring. And, uh, this thing goes the wrong way. Uh, in those 60 years, uh, innumerable, innumerable studies have done. I have only a few of those typical uh, space uh, ships which uh, were developed uh, after uh, the feasibility of going to Mars uh, first was hinted at by um, Werner von Braun, uh, who had shown with his uh, V2 missile that rocket propulsion can actually fly outside the atmosphere and work in, uh, in the airless space. And so people started to ask, well, if that is possible, uh, can we one day go to Mars? And it set off a, a whole flood of studies throughout the decades, uh, and just a few of them are here. Uh, Werner uh, was the first one uh, who, in 1948, uh, did uh, a serious techno-scientifically acceptable study on how to go to Mars. Uh, he, um, did a f he wrote a, a novel first, a technical tale he called it. We would call it a science fiction novel, but he, uh, he didn't want uh, the word fiction in there, so he called it technical tale. Uh, he wrote that in the late 40s, and as a, almost as an appendix uh, of it, he provided uh, the, the technical uh, study itself, which is uh, shown here, the Mars project, 
uh, was uh, published in 1952, first in German, and then in 1953 in English by the University of Illinois, uh, and they re really uh, republished it later in a paperback. Uh, in the preface, in the, in the foreword, uh, von Braun himself wrote, uh, the author did the work in his spare time and his sole computational tool was a slide rule. But uh, he laid out the entire Mars expedition. He came up with uh, the main four chunks or phases of a Mars expedition, which we still use today, namely uh, launch into Earth's orbit, assembling the Mars ship in Earth's orbit, uh, uh, doing the trans-Mars injection, flying to Mars would be uh, number two. Going into Mars orbit and landing is number three, and then returning from Mars, flying back to Earth is number four. So you can actually segment Mars expedition in four parts, and he already showed that. But his uh, uh, plan was just gigantic. It, it dwarfed anything people had ever seen before. Uh, despite the Manhattan Project, which was the nuclear bomb or the B-52 bomber. Um, um, that Mars project uh, was so gigantic, uh, he sent 10 ships to Mars in his uh, vision, uh, each one about 3,720 3, tons, three landers of 200 tons each, uh, they are the ones with the, with the wings, and uh, 70 crew members on board. Uh, to launch this into orbit and assemble uh, in Earth's orbit, he needed 46 um, reusable uh, heavy lift launchers, each one 20 times reusable, so he uh, came to a total assembly flight number of 950 in order to assemble that fleet. Uh, and each of those heavy lifters uh, had a lift of mass of 6,400 tons, about three times uh, that of the Saturn V. So it was uh, gigantic, and uh, the mission would have taken two years and 239 days. Uh, he later redid it when he realized that that may have been maybe just too much for a country, <laughs> a country that just came out of the Korean War. Uh, and so he scrapped it, he really pared it down uh, to two uh, spaceships down there in 1956, um, which uh, had uh, much less EMEO in uh, initial mass in Earth's orbit. That's really the, the key parameter when you build a Mars expedition. How much mass do you need for the spaceship in, in Earth's orbit? And uh, those were about 1,700 tons, about half of what the first ones were. Uh, he had only 12 crew members and uh, two ships for safety. And one of them was a passenger ship uh, without the wings and the cargo ship uh, had the wings uh, with a lander that could have landed on Mars. There were eight people on the passenger ship and four people on the cargo ship. Also, uh, the other person uh, in, the, in that group of old-timers uh, from Peenemünde was uh, Dr. Ernst Stuhlinger, here shown on the left. Uh, who uh, championed electric propulsion. He came up with the very first Mars uh, project uh, based on electric propulsion. Um, an earlier uh, study is shown uh, on top from 1957 and later 1962 um, uh, using uh, both of uh, nuclear power for providing the current for the electric uh, propulsion units. Uh, the picture on the, uh, in the right corner shows uh, Werner von Braun and uh, Dr. Stuhlinger uh, as uh, filmed by Walt Disney uh, in, in one of the uh, films made by Walt Disney to support uh, von Braun's ideas. And here you see uh, Stuhlinger explaining the electric, pro uh, electric spaceship to Werner. Um, uh, those years in the 50s, um, featured a lot of outreach to the public. Von Braun uh, knew from the beginning that in order to get any support for his plans, he needed to talk to the people. And he was a great salesman. Uh, and the people like Walt Disney up in the left corner 
uh, realized that immediately and pulled him aboard for a number of movies uh, which uh, the, uh, Disney made. Uh, some of them, uh, or all of them, were shown then to the public. Millions of people have s uh, seen it and uh, were shaken awake by, by that. Uh, all of a sudden they realized, hey, we can fly into space if this guy with a strange accent uh, says so, it must be, uh, must be true. You know, when you have a German accent, people believe you. you know, it, uh, <laughs> just, look at, just look at Henry Kissinger. <laughs> But, but anyway, uh, Collier's magazine came out with uh, the famous editions in 1952 uh, and 1953 uh, where all of those I ideas which we still use today were introduced like a space, uh, space suits down in, the, in the, uh, the bottom or the space station on the left side, kind of a wheel shaped, 75 meters in diameter and uh, various spaceship configurations. Well, I uh, couldn't help. Uh, we are now getting into the 1960s, the 1950s uh, being over, and I couldn't help sneaking that in. That uh, shows uh, the moment when I just had arrived in Huntsville, and the guy there on the upper left uh, uh, is me in August 1962. Uh, Huntsville really was a very, very nice place at that time. Uh, we, we, we called it Hans Patch. And uh, all the, the green areas behind uh, my picture there uh, were still cotton fields, uh, virtually cotton fields. Today it's all built in, you know, it's all built up. And of course those signs, welcome to Huntsville Rocket City and missile and space capital aren't there anymore. Uh, I'm glad I had those pictures. And that the car uh, was uh, really my most favorite car in my whole life, a Chevy, Chevy Impala. Um, uh, you know, eight cylinder beautiful and uh, I, I drove it for 43 years uh, just about three or four years ago uh, some uh, old car uh, champions or buffs saw it and bought it from me and they are now working on getting it uh, getting it back into uh, into the original shape but I drove it 43 years uh, she had a female character uh, I called her Emma and uh, uh, well, she always, almost, uh, always did what I told her. <laughs> but I, uh, th uh, there were so much memories connected. My father was uh, sitting in there one day. Uh, von Braun was sitting uh, in there often. So I never could part with it. And so out of nostalgia, I kept it all those 40, over 40 years. And as I said, I just sold it out in Alexandria three or four years ago. Huntsville was really down there. I mean, this is the way it looked, and uh, we all liked it very much. Um, and of every time I'm down there, I'm rem uh, reminded of that. The 1960s, uh, of course, uh, was a time when the Cold War uh, exerted itself in space, when uh, the Soviets challenged us with uh, Sputnik in 1958, and uh, two Sputniks in 1958, in 1957, I'm sorry, 1957, and then Yuri Gagarin in 1961, and it really uh, shook people uh, uh, to the bone. It was a shock. Uh, it had started with uh, President Eisenhower watching the Disney movies in the White House. He actually asked for them. Uh, and uh, then came Sputnik 1 in 1957, October, and in 1958, NASA was established as kind of a reaction, and the Disney movies certainly helped for that, but uh, uh, Sergei Korolev from Russia with his Sputniks actually um, provided the major uh, impetus for, uh, for, the, for NASA to come about, 1958, October, and in 1960, the Marshall Space Flight Center in Huntsville was established, um, to actually do something about rocket propulsion and the only people who were familiar with rocket propulsion was von Braun and his team. So I, being a student back then for me it was uh, you know, natural to uh, try to uh, join that group and as you've seen in that picture before in August 1962 uh, von Braun had uh, brought me over and uh, I started work there. Never regretted it. We built the sedans up in the left corner and uh, the Russians uh, built the N1 uh, on the right upper corner, about the same size of the sedan. 
uh, but they were not very fortunate. It flew four times and exploded four times, so that was the end of the uh, moon race, as far as the Russians were, con were concerned. Uh, they went on uh, and built uh, the uh, Energia up in the lower right corner, a huge power pack f of, of a rocket, uh, which also launched the Soviet shuttle called Buran, there in the lower left corner, in the lower left uh, uh, picture. And we had our own shuttle there on the left, and then there was the space station Mir and our own first space station Skylab. So that was essentially what we uh, started building in the 60s, and it went on into 70s. Uh, as far as Mars is concerned, uh, the 60s um, uh, meant for us at Huntsville Saturn V, and so all the Mars studies we did at that time were based on the Saturn V with its 10 meter uh, diameter. And uh, after the Apollo lunar landing in July uh, 1969, uh, this was the uh, parade in Huntsville with von Braun being carried around. And those were the typical signs being held up. Uh, they knew that he was a champion of Mars. And so there were people in the crowd, suck it to Mars, von Braun. So that was a clear message uh, from the man on the street, so to speak. And uh, we heeded it. Uh, I think NASA thought, yeah, that's the next step then. We thought that the Apollo program would go on, that we would establish some kind of a presence on the moon. We had the Apollo extension systems after Apollo. We had the Apollo application program um, and landed there six times um, uh, until the early 1970s. So. Uh, we, f we felt pretty sure that we would go on to Mars. And so we looked at the Saturn and came up with all kinds of uh, follow-on configurations. Um, on the very left is the, the basic Saturn, and then by adding all kinds of uh, extensions, uh, elongations of the stages or strapping on boosters, um, we got higher payloads. Um, there were all kinds of you know, just like our heavy lift people have been uh, looking at in the last few years. Uh, we did that already in the 60s. And not enough with Saturn Vs. We always, we always thought that there must be a follow-on called a post-Saturn. So we had up in the right corner uh, rockets which went beyond uh, Saturn V. Saturn V again there being on the, in the, lef on the left side. Uh, and from there you could kind of put together all kinds of configurations. And uh, then the famous Nova uh, rockets uh, on the bottom, all of those were, were designed, uh, conceptualized at least, uh, with Mars in mind uh, in by industry studies. Uh, on, the on the far left uh, is the basic Saturn, and next to it, uh, the original Nova, which had preceded the Saturn V in our studies. Originally, we wanted uh, to fly to the moon directly, not like Apollo, but launch on Earth and land on the moon without any big maneuvers in between. That would have taken that Nova with eight F1 engines. And then uh, NASA uh, went through trade-off studies and came up with Earth orbit rendezvous and with lunar orbit rendezvous modes uh, and rejected the direct flight mode um, for cost reasons and um, also the size of the vehicle. So finally, the outcome was lunar orbit rendezvous, um, uh, and uh, that then kind of um, uh, finalized the design of the Saturn V with five F1 engines. Uh, but those monsters uh, were, you know, uh, spawned by by mental engineering a tremendous creativity we got out of out of our teams out of industry at that time um, i always like this one that's the biggest of them all it's a single stage to orbit called nexus uh, proposed by uh, kraft erike uh, who was at general dynamics at that time and he was a man behind the centaur stage which is still flying uh, so it, this came from in 1964 and uh, it would have uh, launched 1,000 tons into orbit. So you would need only this one for, to fly to Mars uh, from orbit. Uh, the EMEO, the initial mass in Earth's orbit for Mars, wants to be not less than 700 tons. 
depending on propulsion like chemical or nuclear or electric propulsion and also on the time of uh, you know, the years when you fly. But basically what we need is like 700 to tons in orbit and that decides what kind of heavy lift do we need, do we have to build today. So that one could launch a thousand tons and it weighed uh, 24,000 tons at liftoff, which is about uh, the mass of a, an ocean freighter. Now, it never was built, of course. Um, as far as Mars is concerned, uh, the studies were bundled uh, in a package called Empire, early manned planetary, interplanetary uh, round trip uh, expedition and was parceled out to a bunch of uh, industries, large industries like Ford, General Dynamics, Lockheed, TRW, Boeing. And they all came in with their various proposals how to go to Mars. The Empire studies were t tremendously creative. They developed a, a, a treasure trough of knowledge, of engineering insight, of uh, 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 rationalities which still uh, is valid today. If people were just uh, go to the uh, libraries or looking into archives they would find a lot of answers there without having to reinvent the wheels because we really tried to cover the waterfront with those empire studies in the 60s. Um, we looked at Mars uh, flybys, manned flybys and when I say manned I certainly don't mean it in a, in a uh, political incorrect way, uh, but that's the way it was called. In fact, uh, the question whether there should men or women on board never came up in that in those uh, years. Uh, when von, von Braun talked about 70 people to Mars or 60 people to Mars, uh, he didn't specify, you know, that these are just males. Uh, it was the, the, the subject was not discussed. It was just, you know, uh, totally uh, beyond uh, engineering. Uh, levels. Anyway, um, so uh, manned uh, uh, flybys, manned uh, stopovers and manned landings and not just uh, Mars but Venus and uh, you could actually have uh, double flybys, fly by Venus and then also fly by Mars at the same time. Get two bucks you know for one shot and uh, use Venus uh, as a propulsive uh, assistant either to accelerate you as in a flyby or decelerate you on the way uh, coming back to Earth. Um, back in the Soviet Union, people didn't sleep either. Uh, this guy, Sergei Korolev, the, the von Braun of, of, uh, of Russia, um, uh, thought in the late 50s already, in the early 60s, uh, the same things, the same thoughts uh, he later, of course, uh, was a guy behind uh, Sputnik, behind Gagarin, and uh, behind Soyuz, uh, and it's still flying today. I mean, he was a real genius, uh, hard-headed, I mean, uh, uh, stubborn like that. He had always to fight against the politicians in Moscow, yeah, but he got his way, and uh, he also had competitors, all kinds of little uh, Princetons, where other designers had their own schools, their own developments, their own sponsors in Moscow. Uh, so it was not just like a unified NASA there, it was uh, five or six different groups fighting against each other for the dollar or for the rubles. And um, so he had a real complicated life. Uh, he died early, just like von Braun in the late, in the, uh, late 60s uh, years. Uh, we know, of course, uh, his daughter, Natalia, she's been to NASA, we have invited her several times, and uh, 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 she's now number one as far as uh, prominence uh, in space in Moscow because she's his daughter, and so every time uh, they are trotting out celebrities, uh, she's in front of it, Natalia. She's about 74 now, and a physician, a doctor of surgery, a uh, very, very nice uh, lady uh, who's been fighting for years uh, to find out who her daddy really was and what people are thinking about it. When we celebrated the Explorer 1 anniversary in Huntsville a few years ago, we invited Natalia because without uh, her daddy, uh, our Explorer never would have flown. There wouldn't have been a Sputnik and we wouldn't have feel, felt challenged. 
So when we invited her and she really liked that and she came back and said, now I know, you know what you people think about my father and it makes me happy. So that was Korolev and he thought about Mars. Uh, I have this book here, um, uh, Marsiansky Project by Korolev, uh, the Mars Project by Korolev, which describes in detail what they wanted to do uh, uh, in, in 1964. Uh, he uh, came up with the first ideas of uh, the N1 rocket. Uh, here is the one uh, which they used to uh, try to beat us to the moon with uh, their version of the Saturn V. But the plans for the N1 are much older than the space race. Uh, he originally sketched the N1 in support for Mars. Uh, he gave it a payload, an orbital payload of 75 to 85 tons, which would have fit into their Mars scenario. Uh, he didn't want to have a landing there. He wanted to have a flyby first. And so later on, uh, that backfired because when the N1 then was built, it had only 75 or 85 tons orbital payload uh, compared to 120 tons uh, by the Saturn V. And so that may have contributed to them losing the space race to the moon. Uh, but uh, basically the design of the N1 goes back to those years. The first uh, uh, Mars project in Russia was called Aelita. Uh, after a famous uh, socialist uh, film uh, from 1924 uh, where uh, Aelita is the queen of Mars. You know, something like uh, Edgar Rice Perot did for us here. So that was uh, uh, the 60s. Now we are coming to... Oh yeah, th this is a picture of Korolev's uh, uh, Mars ship. Um, the assembly on the far left uh, required an assembly shack, the spherical one, the, the ball-like uh, uh, housing there in the middle. This is where the, um, the assembly people, the uh, cosmonauts, uh, stayed. Um, there is a Soyuz uh, spaceship actually docked to it. And then it had six to eight docking ports where uh, the stages could dock and then be linked together to assemble the Mars ship. It was a pretty smart idea. Who knows, you know, maybe something like that is what we want to do one day. Uh, on the one side, away from us, is the actual Mars ship, and on the nearest side here is where the propulsion modules are uh, strapped together, uh, which he needed. And then the ship itself is shown here uh, in, a, uh, in a section uh, with those uh, f f uh, floor plans and so on. Um, with a uh, energy, uh, solar energy uh, collecting um, uh, uh, shield and then the uh, propulsion unit at the bottom. This is uh, their plan at that time in 64. Um, it would have, uh, up in the left corner, it would have required a whole number of N1 rockets uh, to launch the components into Earth's orbit where they would be assembled as I just showed then uh, the departure to Mars would take place, uh, propulsion modules being dropped as they emptied, so you don't want to carry dead mass along. And then um, finally turning around and uh, separating the landing module in red, uh, landing on Mars. Then the ascent stage going up again, uh, uh, rendezvousing with the orbiting uh, Mars ship um, in orbit and then returning back uh, to Earth. That is taken from uh, Korolev's book. Uh, they figured out all kinds of requirements. Uh, here is a table where he looked at various flight modes to Mars, uh, orbiters and landers and return flights, um, and came up in the middle with the tonnage uh, EMEO required in Earth's orbit to carry 20 tons, to deliver 20 tons to Mars. 20 tons is quite a lot uh, if you talk about habitat and uh, provisions and so on. So it would take at the lower, the lower two uh, examples there, uh, like between 600, 700 tons in Earth's orbit minimum uh, to do that. And uh, that number hasn't changed for the last 60 years. So it is a kind of a best uh, or the minimum 
EMEO you need if you want to have a mass flight. If you go up to 1,000, uh, the much, so much the better. Uh, the, the more mass you, you have for the initial mass in Earth's orbit, the more you can take along and the, the longer you can stay on Mars. Uh, he would have just stayed very shortly and come back at least to uh, do something uh, for the first time. Well, now uh, we are coming to the third decade, the 70s. Uh, remember we had uh, the 60s with those tremendous Apollo successes, Apollo 8, Apollo 10, Apollo 11, Apollo 12, in 69. Uh, now we have, we're in 1970, and in the politicians here in, in Washington started asking, what's next? But the, uh, but the administration had changed. Uh, it wasn't President Johnson, uh, Lyndon Johnson anymore. It was President Nixon and uh, the Republicans. And so they asked, well, what should we do now? Um, uh, we cannot just take you know, to continue the way they wanted the, uh, the JFK uh, lunar program. And uh, uh, Nixon had a <coughs> an advisory committee, PSAC, called a President's Science Advisory Committee with the uh, chair, uh, chairman being Lee Dubridge. Uh, they had already in 67 prepared a recommendation uh, that uh, uh, the United States should develop a reusable a shuttle or reusable spaceships, they called it, either fully or partially reusable in order to reduce cost. That was a recommendation in 67. And uh, uh, the White House also uh, had a space task group, STG, space task group, uh, headed by uh, Vice President Agnew, Spyro Agnew, uh, with Lee Dubridge of the PSAC and Robert Siemens, Secretary of the Air Force, and Thomas Paine, NASA administrator, as members. So all of those came to us and said, uh, uh, what next? You have now uh, landed on the moon. And we said, yeah, we want to go on on the moon. And said, no, next we need something, uh, something back here on Earth. Um, the things have changed, Vietnam and so on. So uh, it was uh, fiscal 69 uh, going into fiscal 70. and. Uh, <coughs> uh, we were hoping for a new start, uh, Mars, but there were no new starts. The only thing we got uh, in those early years was in 1972, President Nixon approving the shuttle in, in its minimum form. We had done a lot of shuttle studies before, uh, fully reusable in all kinds of variations, and had to reduce it and cut it back uh, with every iteration. Every time uh, the Bureau of the Budget said, no, that's too much, or uh, some other people told us it's too much. We went back, you know, and uh, and and just you know, like like soldiers, uh, cut it even back down until we got the current shuttle. Uh, at least something, and uh, uh, there wouldn't have been anything else. Uh, these people here, uh, 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 the space task group, were given. Uh, our view of America's next decades in space. That is uh, NASA's. Uh, plan uh, prepared mostly by uh, George Muller, who was the head of uh, the main spaceflight office here at headquarters, and uh, by Werner von Braun at Marshall and Robert Gilrose at the Houston Main Spacecraft Center, uh, and then of course Johnson Space Center. They came up with what's called uh, the Integrated Program Plan, IPP. Uh, <coughs> that was uh, anno 1969, which uh, was presented here in Washington. And uh, you can see uh, it's got everything and the kitchen sink. Um, it's got transportation there, the third row from the top, uh, with a shuttle in there. Um, uh, no, at the bottom, the shuttle, uh, uh, landers, a uh, nuclear tug or nuclear stage, and Mars uh, lander there. And uh, then um, uh, the other things on top, uh, space station uh, uh, on top, and space base, and so on. And in an evolutionary sense, the integrated program plan was kind of uh, parallel developments, uh, uh, developing things at the same time, uh, so to make much uh, or major use out of commonality. So you didn't have to use or reinvent a lunar station when you could use a space station module for it. And uh, you didn't have to redesign a Mars mission module if you could use a space station module instead 
for it. Uh, so there, there was some sense to this because uh, we felt we could reduce costs by commonality, which required parallel developments, but the overall cost uh, still was, of course, tremendous. And uh, we didn't put any years on top. That came only a little later. On August 4, uh, 1969, uh, which uh, you know is, uh, was a very f uh, important uh, date for us, Werner von Braun presented uh, the manned Mars mission portion of it uh, to the Space Task Group. Yeah, I want to go back. Um, that was a study done at Marshall with Boeing, the Boeing uh, as a contractor, uh, which was, for in, my, in our opinion at that time, very reasonable. It was based on the Saturn V. We didn't know yet that the Saturn V was you know, going to be dropped. Uh, it had nuclear propulsion there, uh, the Nerva engine, which had accumulated quite an um, uh, amazing number of successful starts and uh, about 4,000 or even more seconds of firing time um, with a departure of 1981 and return 1986 for the Mars flight. The cost in uh, $69 would have been $4 billion in 1971, uh, increased to 7 to $8 billion uh, by 1975 and returning down to $6 billion in 1976. And uh, we... Uh, we did it in four plans. Uh, the original von Braun plan from 81 launch was called Plan A. And uh, it, it, pre it kind of thought, we thought that this could be an Apollo-like decision. You know, like, like JFK made the decision in May 1961, go to the moon, that s some president uh, now would have to make a decision like that, now go to Mars, and that would have been Plan A. But we came up with Plan B, also at the same time in that booklet I just showed, uh, where the Mars flight, everything else was kept in there. That was uh, George Muller. He said, no, Plan B, Plan C will not be different. It'll just move into time a little bit further. That was his way of trying to save Mars. And so Plan B moved the Mars uh, expedition to 1983 to until 1986, and Plan C uh, Mars 1986 to 1989. So all four plans, all three plans in that booklet uh, were integrated and uh, included Mars. But it did not meet with great support, so NASA <laughs> went back and added Plan D, uh, which, <laughs> which meant no Mars at all, but station and shuttle together, both at the same time. Well, um, let me show. That's another picture of of the Mars ship uh, out of uh, out of Marshall at that time, sixty nine, with the Nerva engine and the propulsion modules or the tank uh, the tank modules, which are dropped when they're empty. And the front portion of the Mars ships, two of them, two ships uh, in 69, are kind of hammer-headed because the, of the diameter of the Mars entry uh, capsule. Uh, we didn't know yet uh, what the atmosphere uh, on Mars uh, was like. So uh, uh, we were kind of uh, uncertain there what kind of uh, Mars lander shape we need. Uh, it was uh, the, f the forward portion was airless. It was a vacuum. You had to, you could enter it through an airlock, so we didn't have to uh, pressurize the entire uh, head uh, head section. I still remember when we talked about that, discussed it, whether that was safe to do. And those little uh, entry uh, Apollo shape uh, uh, shapes are um, scientific probes which we would have dropped onto Mars from orbit before actually landing there. This was the, uh, the mission itself, launched down there on, uh, uh, on Mars in 1981, uh, dropping the first propulsion uh, module uh, halfway out after, <coughs> after the trans-Mars injection, and then uh, going to Mars and going into a high orbit first, 
uh, where the PM2, propulsion module 2, is jettisoned and then circularizing and going into a smaller orbit, into a uh, smaller radius orbit, and there from there land on Mars and then return back and fly back home. Uh, we had a capsule designed, I think that was uh, with the uh, help and assistance of JSC at that time, um, looking like an Apollo capsule, only bigger, and it had a laboratory inside living quarters, a ramp <coughs> for logistics vehicle unloading, and uh, uh, inserted, uh, you see the ascent capsule, the ascent stage. Uh, so uh, to fly up into orbit, you didn't have to take the whole thing up. You just launched out of that hole uh, with the people sitting up on top. Well, before I get to that, uh, let's finish this the sad story of the 70s, uh, as far as this is concerned. Uh, the plan D I mentioned uh, was off the table. Uh, Tom Payne, who was our NASA administrator, then went back and asked for four billion uh, for fiscal um, uh, uh, fiscal uh, seventy fiscal to seventy one. This would have kept the Saturn V in production and provided startup money for the shuttle and station. This was cut by the Bureau of the Budget uh, to three point seven three billion. And then came an across-the-board cut for the whole government of 10%, which left us with 3.33 billion. Uh, we had to close the Electronic Research Center in Cambridge, uh, was one of the NASA centers at that time, and the NASA contractor workforce fell from 190,000 to 140,000 in 1971. Then Congress, and that was just the Bureau of the Budget up to now, then Congress added its own cuts, which left NASA with 3.27 billion, and that was about one third of our budget of the mid 60s in constant year dollars. Well, about that time, they realized something needs to be done. Uh, we cannot just fold it. Uh, we needed piloted flights <coughs> because uh, we wouldn't have had any piloted flights afterwards. So Nixon approved a reduced shuttle in 1971, which was not fully reusable. It flew from 1981 to next July, uh, over 30 years, which uh, is quite an achievement, I would say. <coughs> <coughs> well, also in 1970, uh, NASA went back to studying manned Mars uh, using the von Braun study of 69, uh, reviewing the work and came up uh, with a new start, uh, which th did not require a Saturn V. Saturn V was not there anymore. So uh, we baselined a shuttle-derived launch vehicle as heavy lifter. It would have uh, uh, just uh, taken cr the six crew members for the expedition, so we had, uh, again shrunk it down from 12 to 6. The space station was seen as essential for orbital test and demo flights. Uh, also, there was a competing proposal by a scientist, uh, Fred Singer, who came up with a phobos dimos mission, 1978, a PhD mission uh, called, uh, which used electric propulsion with some chemical assistance, launched from geosynchronous orbit uh, on low thrust, uh, and no space station envisioned. So in order to get all of those parts up to geosynchronous orbits, you needed, uh, I don't know how many, uh, 40 or 50 shuttle flights and some upper stage, some space tug, in order to assemble in geosynchronous. He wanted geosynchronous because uh, the takeoff velocity, the delta V, uh, would have been much less there and he could have used smaller engines and electric propulsion. And outside, in, in those 70s, uh, 70s uh, were kind of a, a no-action type. Uh, we had to sit and twiddle our thumbs because the shuttle was being developed, uh, you know, behind the scenery where nobody could see it. So the public lost interest in space more and more. Uh, Congress, um, who, which reviewed our budget every year, uh, was just as, uh, you know, uh, uninterested. There wasn't anything going on uh, after the... Uh, Skylab flights in 73 and the ASTP, the Apollo-Soyuz test project, those were not new starts. They were just kind of 
at the tail end of existing uh, programs. Um, there was nothing else we had, could show. So there was one year when the shuttle program was saved in Congress by only one voice. Um, <coughs> we were pretty fortunate. Our opponents were pretty strong, uh, mostly Democrats. Uh, there was uh, Senator Proxmire, Senator Mondale, who later, of course, uh, became a vice president. So those 70s were tough, really tough. And uh, unfortunately, we had the shuttle, which was being designed and built uh, out, out of view, so to speak. Outside, uh, people became impatient and normal, you know, people about Mars. And so up sprung a number, a whole numerous uh, number of uh, Mars underground activities. It was called the Mars Underground uh, External Study Activities. They had um, Mars uh, Symposia, the case of Mars Symposia, which we monitored or set in on. Uh, but for NASA, there wasn't really much to do. NASA didn't really have any long-range plans beyond uh, Apollo, as I just said. We just continued into Skylab uh, using a, an upper stage, that's the S4B stage from Saturn, and using the, uh, the last Saturn 1B for the Apollo Soyuz test project. So uh, I was brought up in 74 from Marshall uh, to do long-range planning. Uh, they, they had no idea what, what it is, how to do, how to go about it. Uh, the future looked like a big black hole. Uh, you know, everyone thought, well, we should have this, we should have that, we should have a space station. And you had to put a structure into that future. You had to structure it. And so I came up with this railroad switching yard, I called it, which uh, was not supposed to you know, happen all in parallel, but it uh, at least told us where to put certain things. There was on the bottom the transportation line coming from the shuttle uh, with the large lift vehicle there and the uh, OTV, which was the orbital transfer vehicle or TAG, which also had an advanced version there, uh, lunar logistics lander, advanced lunar lander, and at the bottom nuclear propulsion stages. Then in the middle, a space station uh, evolution uh, coming from Skylab and from Space Lab. Uh, on the left side is where we were. That was what I called the, pu the push, things pushing us forward. And on the way on the right side was pull. Lots of ideas which people wanted to see in their future one day. And we can't, couldn't just single out one. We couldn't, couldn't just say, well, we all want to do this. So I had to leave it open and put the major ones here, Earth orbit space community, solar power plants in space, lunar colony, L5 colony, and Mars settlement and then show you know, the vector relationships in that tree of rel relevance to show what needs to go where and what needs to be developed first. Uh, that still um, uh, would apply uh, you know, without any years on, uh, on top uh, because essentially that's what you need. You need precursors uh, in order to do the very large steps and if you want to go to Mars uh, you do need a space station uh, and the other things too. So um, it gave us a structure of which we can use then to put studies, uh, go out to industry and do contracted studies, uh, mostly space industrialization studies in, uh, on the Earth orbit line there. Well, that was in the 70s, and uh, Mars uh, played a role, mostly external, as I said, with Mars underground and not so much. Uh, in NASA, except for that one study I mentioned where we redid the 69 study of von Braun. Uh, now we come to the 1980s, the fourth decade, and that was a decade of Ronald Reagan, uh, from, uh, who was president from 1981 to 1989. Um, again, the question was, what next? What should we do now? Uh, his vice president was the elder Bush, and uh, he set up a ENCOS, National Commission on Space, in 1985, uh, headed by Thomas Paine again, formerly NASA administrator, uh, to take a look at the next 50 years in space to kind of uh, structure the future which had never been done before, sh show where things uh, had their proper place and what needs to be done first. So they came up with a, out with a report on the next 50 years in space 
which uh, was uh, very, very good, very realistic in certain areas, but also very idealistic in other areas, um, kind of free thinking type uh, ideas. And it came unfortunately out in May 1986, Uh, just three or four months after the Challenger accident. So it came out in a time it couldn't have been worse uh, for, for an effort like that. Uh, that was a handicap. Uh, but we had a report which was uh, you know, pretty um, uh, you know, uh, all-inclusive, so to speak. Um, so uh, Fletcher, who was uh, our administrator at that time, asked uh, uh, the female astronaut, the first uh, American woman in orbit, Sally Wright, to collect a group of people and do and single out, you know, what can be done with the uh, Tom Paine report. So she came up with a committee, I was a member of that, and in 1987 put out the Wright report, uh, which uh, had boiled down uh, the ENCOS report to four alternative long-range, long-term initiatives with the first human on Mars um, set for 2005. The other alternatives were more down to Earth. There was particularly mission planet Earth, which um, was quite uh, important at that time and uh, kind of spawned a lot of uh, initiatives uh, having to do with the environment and, uh, and our, our own uh, ecology down on Earth. But Mars was still in there. And uh, at the end, <coughs> when uh, uh, President Reagan finished in 89, uh, January, and uh, George H.W. Bush took over as president, um, he, he was saddled with SDI, which uh, President Reagan had come up with, Space, de uh, space uh, Defense Initiative, where he wanted to use space developments in a big defensive posture with battle stations in orbit and so on. Um, <coughs> uh, and had already turned on industry to that a lot. So when Bush came, uh, he uh, had two, uh, two concerns. First of all, what to do in space? <coughs> what can we do with Sally Wright's report? And secondly, uh, how can I help all those victims uh, of SDI after that program collapsed? You know, industry, uh, all the, the workforce, the SDI people. So po uh, President Bush on... Uh, July 20, 1989, exactly 20 years after Apollo 11 landing, uh, not, not a coincidence, uh, presented uh, the SEI, uh, just changed one letter, from D to E, Space Exploration Initiative, which put a peaceful evolutionary concept, long-range concept, very, very good, very rational, instead of this SDI idea, and in essentially, Uh, said that, hey, if we do S SEI, uh, we can keep all the people in work and just, you know, redirect them a little bit. Uh, where did he get the SEI material? Well, from a 90-day study, which NASA did pretty quickly uh, a few months earlier, uh, in late 88 or early 1989, uh, uh, a 90-day study to, uh, which included Moon and Mars, And that was then kind of folded into the SEI by George Bush uh, into five uh, different reference programs. Again, you know, a whole collection of ideas. And uh, let's see what we got in pictures. No. Yeah, I'll go to that. Um, so the SEI had a whole bunch of ideas. So. Um, Uh, Bush turned to his vice president, Dan Quayle, and said, well, you handle it. And uh, uh, took a little while for Dan Quayle to realize what a tremendous job this SEI really meant. And so he came to NASA for help and said, um, uh, we need a public outreach. You know, if, you don't know, if you don't know what to do, you always say, let's clue in, let's uh, go uh, do an outreach and ask people outside what they want. Uh, and so NASA did a public outreach, the SEI ou outreach, to, co to collect alternative ideas from the public. Thousands came in of ideas and were all evaluated for us by the Rand Corporation. Uh, there were lots of science fiction ideas in there. Very few made really sense, 
because we had already in the previous years covered the waterfront. We had all the ideas already. There were no big surprises, uh, but Rand Corporation organized them properly and uh, uh, we set up a special committee uh, headed by General Thomas Stafford, the Apollo 10 astronaut and ASTP astronaut, a very respected uh, man even today, uh, still around and he helping us with the Russians. Uh, the so-called synthesis group, and the synthesis group under Tom Stafford distilled all the results of the RAND study down into four prime alternative exploration architectures, which now uh, brings us to 1990. Uh, this uh, uh, is, uh, takes me back to the Energia uh, picture earlier because uh, the Mars underground people, the external people, uh, got together with the Russians uh, and Gorshkov, Igor Gorshkov, uh, who had come up with their own Mars plans. And so our people thought, hey, it might be a great idea to use a Russian Energia as a launch vehicle, a heavy launcher for Mars. And um, so uh, they distributed all kinds of ads uh, looking like that. Uh, what uh, Semyonov and Gorshkov uh, back in the uh, uh, 80s had developed, uh, and you can, you can actually get it on, online, the Energia people put it on their uh, internet, uh, is this uh, Mars concept using only electric propulsion, where you have to um, spiral out uh, from uh, Earth uh, uh, on the here on the uh, right lower corner, and once you are fast enough, and you have to spiral out because electric propulsion has is so much low thrust. It's just, you know, blowing against the sheet of paper almost, uh, but it goes for days and weeks and months. Uh, so the thrust force adds up and the velocity adds up, which means uh, they have to work a long time in electric propulsion, but they do add up to very high velocities. And so you need to spiral out until you are fast enough to break away <laughs> and go to uh, trans-Mars injection and then do the same on Mars, spiral in and land and then come back to Earth. That was what Semyonov and Gorshkov at that time proposed and our people thought, hey, we could use the Energia uh, uh, rocket, uh, that big power pack, with our own spaceship. Uh, nuclear developments, I got that from a Russian uh, uh, presentation uh, a few weeks ago. Uh, were going on in both countries. On the left, our NERVA development. On the right, uh, the Russian nuclear rocket engine uh, with parameters which showed that both of them had already uh, undergone quite a number of tests um, and power on different power levels. Uh, we called our program first Phoebus, the Phoebus program, and the NERVA engine, nuclear engine, uh, rocket uh, vehicle application, NERVA, N-E-R-V-A. Uh, and we put it into a rocket stage called RIFT, Rocket uh, Reactor In-Flight Test. Uh, that we actually had a program office at Marshall uh, which designed the RIFT stage for an upper stage for the Saturn V. Um, the Russians did it similarly with their NRE. And then, of course, uh, the Nuclear Test Ban Treaty <coughs> later on uh, put a stop to all of that. Those tests uh, were not done in open air. Yeah, they were done in, in closed environments, underground and so on. So we didn't really endanger the atmosphere with our testing. And we never would have ignited a nuclear engine while still in the atmosphere. All the program plans for Mars always uh, assumed that the upper stages in nuclear uh, propulsion would be ignited way away from the atmosphere, out in empty space. Uh, but still, we fell under that nuclear test ban treaty, and so at that time, all the nuclear efforts stopped. Today, the Russians have uh, this type of concept. They are using a combination of nuclear and electric. Uh, this uh, particular one um, uh, uses, uh, in, uh, on the, the rocket engine is on the far right, and the electric propulsion units are there uh, those red, little red uh, thrusters, um, which uh, are uh, the, ma the uh, um, in-flight propulsion, uh, which go on for weeks and weeks. The payload is green, number one, and the blue area is the radiator for cooling the nuclear uh, propulsion system, 
Uh, in this particular case, it's using a droplet radiator cooling. And um, in this one, it's the same vehicle, but it uses a uh, radiating cooler using uh, a, 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 normal, a normal radiator like we have on, thank you, like we have on, um, on, on the ISS uh, for cooling the engine. So this is what the, Russian, the Russians are showing right now, uh, Mr. Uh, Korotyev of the uh, Keldish uh, Research uh, Corporation uh, has uh, shown that around in his presentation. So they are, they are doing it, they are working it, and we are actually thinking of talking to them about nuclear rocket development or, or in-orbit in uh, propulsion. So we are not really limiting to nuclear, we also mean uh, electric propulsion. And if they are already ahead of us, uh, because they are not so much limited uh, uh, by popular you know, antipathy, uh, we ought to get together, and so some talks are being done in that area. Well, uh, this takes us uh, now into the 1980s. No, no, this is still 1980 here. Uh, we had uh, internal studies. Uh, those are some books I co uh, collected back in, uh, at Marshall in 86 where we had symposia, uh, th th uh, where we came up with a Mars um, NASA reference mission. And that really basically hasn't changed too much. Uh, when, when we wanted to fly to Mars, we are talking about two launches. One uh, flying in the first year with a cargo flight, which deposits, deposits some equipment on Mars, a habitat, or maybe even a kind of a little factory which uses ISRU, in situ resource utilization, ISRU, and, pro and actually goes to work uh, producing um, uh, oxygen or uh, hydrogen, particularly methane, CH4, uh, as, pro uh, uh, as propellant. And uh, about two and, a, two and a half years, 2.13 years later, the second um, launch vehicle would carry people behind it. Uh, so we have two flights separated by a uh, synodic period. Uh, when you fly to Mars, uh, those uh, optimum uh, constellation opportunities repeat only every two years. And then you have to wait. So w once you're sitting on Mars and waiting for the next resupply, you have to wait for 2.13 years until uh, the constellation, you know, the, the positions of Earth and Mars are just right uh, to get to you with minimum energy. So basically, that uh, NASA reference mi mission is still around and it's still being uh, uh, you know, uh, used today. Uh, those studies uh, came up with uh, habitat concepts like here. Um, what I've done is I, I cut this panorama picture in half. So uh, the lower left uh, uh, rim of the picture should be attached to the upper right one. Um, of, of the picture, then you get kind of a feeling of uh, what they were talking about in those years. Uh, those studies uh, developed those concepts. Uh, they were done at various places. They uh, were done by NASA people with s uh, sponsorship uh, by, uh, on the left side, the Lunar and Planetary Institute in Houston uh, in 1992 and uh, by Ames in 1993. So we did get other centers involved. Uh, that's another concept uh, which came out of those years, uh, showing two habitats. We, we still always were talking two things in order to have a backup capability. Um, that was later reduced uh, when some more cuts were done. <coughs> Before I get to this, a few words uh, now, uh, still to the SEI. Uh, by George Bush, by George H. W. Bush. Uh, it was far-sighted and logical, a good roadmap. But there was no funding linked to it. <laughs> I think we've heard that all before already. <laughs> um, <laughs> Bush Jr. <laughs> did the same thing to us. Um, estimates by NASA were in the, in the range of 400 to 500 billion spread over 30 years. But that immediately, you know, kind of, um, you know, 
was rejected by Congress. It didn't receive any favorable comments. Uh, 400 billion, what are you talking about? And we were, hey, it's spread over 30 years. No, 400 billion is so much. And today, when you look at the economic crisis, what some of the banks have been doing, you know, for them, uh, hundreds of billions is you know, peanuts. So at that time, um, 1980, it looked like a lot of money. And it did away, unfortunately, with a beautiful roadmap. Um, we maybe shouldn't have costed out the whole thing, the whole piece of potato, um, the whole 30 years. We maybe should have, uh, uh, NASA should have probably approached it in a different way uh, to get it across. In 93, in the Clinton administration, which followed uh, the um, uh, Bush senior administration, SAE kicked the bucket, but it wasn't really dead. At NASA, particularly at JSC, SEI did not entirely disappear. It mutated in uh, all kinds of mostly in-house studies. Uh, first came FLO, FLOW, first lunar orb outpost uh, done at, uh, at uh, uh, JSC. Uh, and uh, Mike Griffin, who we all fondly remember, uh, was at that time um, uh, head of exploration here at headquarters. Uh, so Mike Griffin extended flow of first lunar outpost to include Mars because he felt like we did many years before that uh, commonality of engineering developments could save money. And if you develop anything for the lunar outpost, you might as well use it uh, also for Mars. And so he folded Mars into it. And the outcome was the first of several DRMs, Design Referent Mission. Um, when he, when Mike Griffin headed exploration here at the uh, headquarters, the uh, DRM-1, Design Reference Mission 1, still needed a heavy lifter. You cannot go uh, beyond Earth's orbit without a heavy lift launch vehicle. And the one they came up with uh, was uh, launched 240 tons to Earth's orbit, double of what the Saturn V could have done. That was the idea, double the Saturn V uh, capability. And it would have brought 100 tons to Mars. Sta uh, there was no station involved, no orbital assembly in, or in Earth's orbit required. A crew of six, and they would rely, uh, they would use that particular <coughs> mode I just indicated, first cargo launch and then uh, several cargo launches, in fact, three cargo launches, and then people with the force uh, afterwards. Uh, and they used ISRU. They would have to de had to depend on uh, in situ resource utilization. That means the first cargo flights had to prove the pudding, that actually uh, something could be done about it. And uh, if not, then they would have had to take all the return propellant along instead of manufacturing it on Mars. Um, that was in the 90s, and uh, things were going really slowly. We had shuttle, flight, shuttle, shuttle flights going on. We had a space station. Uh, when all of a sudden um, a, a, a meteorite was found in 1996, a Mars meteorite, uh, AH84001, uh, which had uh, allegedly a microbic uh, life or signs of former microbic life inside, uh, which indicated to a lot of people, hey, there could have been life on Mars. If that, Mar if that meteorite came from Mars, uh, those microbes inside could prove that there's life on Mars, which immediately raised public interest in Mars, particularly in Bill Clinton. And uh, he made a big you know, White House announcement out of that, uh, that NASA has found uh, Mars uh, living uh, Mars beings in a Mars meteoroid. Uh, it never, you know, never was proven that this was actually microbes. Uh, there were all kinds of opposing explanations. So even t up to today, we don't really know uh, what, what it was, what they found in there. But it did raise public interest tremendously. And uh, it did particularly do us good in that the exploration office at JSC was reestablished. JSC wound up with a new exploration office because mostly of that meteorite. Well, uh, they immediately went into the DRMing, uh, came up with uh, new design uh, reference missions, uh, particularly number three, DRM3, 
uh, was done by scrubbing DRM1 down, make it more modest, uh, in 1997. Uh, it had a nuclear thermal uh, rocket uh, um, uh, stage. It had a shuttle-derived launch vehicle, but not a heavy lift uh, launch vehicle. Uh, it had in situ resource utilization and launched only one habitat to Mars instead of two. So it, it used half of the launch vehicles uh, on Earth. And then uh, we went and came to the year 2000 and uh, DRM4 was the next one, uh, which was a new iteration on the def design reference mission, uh, which helped uh, President uh, George W. Bush who was president, now president, uh, in January 2004 to come in here in that auditorium up front and propose the Constellation program. I remember that day, we, was, we were all totally excited. We had a whole bunch of uh, genuine astronauts sitting there in their flight suits. Uh, Gene Cernan was there and, uh, and uh, President uh, Bush went to him and said, Gene, uh, you, when you were on the moon with Apollo 17, uh, you were the last uh, man on the moon, and I tell you, uh, you are not going to remain the last man on the moon. So he promised it. But there was no money attached uh, to uh, those beautiful plans. Uh, so we got Constellation, which uh, spawned RS-1 and RS-5. The RS-5 would have been the heavy lifter, which we need desperately. And uh, they uh, went through this particular uh, architectural trade tree um, and when you see the, all those red crosses that's uh, uh, where you know developments were mixed were not uh, used but the light blue line is what finally was settled on uh, after going through 48 uh, configurations at the bottom you see all the different uh, configurations which come from uh, combining the various options uh, in, in the various areas. Uh, I can't read it from here all the time, but you see that the propulsion decisions were made and um, that uh, 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 pre-deploy uh, missions were selected. Pre-deploy means you la launch your unmanned payload first. And so uh, finally they wound up with a light blue line, which is essentially uh, what uh, DRA, DRA5 is all about and probably hopefully remains. And this is what uh, the flight plan uh, looked, looks like and hopefully lo will look like uh, in a very reasonable time frame. Um, departure on Earth in 2035 uh, for the cargo flight uh, and uh, landing in 2036 uh, on Mars. And then uh, the second flight with the people on board launching uh, in August 2037 and uh, uh, returning in uh, February 2038. So uh, even today when you talk to uh, President Obama or anyone, uh, they all say, well, I think by the 1930s we should be able to do it. And it's based uh, on the DR, uh, DRM, uh, DRA5, the architecture. It's not M, it's ar architecture. So um, let's cling to that. Let's hope that uh, we can make something out of that. Uh, the uh, Russians, I mentioned that, um, are working at the same time. They are uh, doing their work in a very more uh, visible way. They have a simulation program going on called Mars 500, uh, which we visited uh, some time ago in, in Moscow. Uh, it's run by IBMP, Institute of Biomedical Problems. And uh, there are six crew mem members locked up in a Mars ship simulation with various modules. They landed on Mars, simulated, um, and actually exited into another module which had a simulated Mars surface. And they did in, in spacesuits and they did various things, went back on board, and they are now on their flight back to Earth, um, which takes 280 days or thereabouts. There are six guys uh, locked up in there. Um, uh, three Russians, uh, one European, uh, one Chinese, and uh, 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 yeah, uh, uh, ESA, China, and four Russians. So uh, they are on the return trip. The mission will end. That means they land on Earth 
in November 2011, a few months from now, and there may be follow-ons. They have been talking to us and we to them, how can we use their experience in locking up these people for you know, well over a year, uh, and they are still alive, apparently they haven't killed each other yet. <laughs> Uh, I'm following that every time uh, board. They have uh, every time when I uh, when I talk to these people, they are in good shape, um, and uh, the, the the information being collected by the doctors, particularly and the nutrition people and so on, is tremendous. Yeah, we should make use of that one day if we can get together in in similar uh, similar things. Uh, so we have now essentially this uh, mode where you uh, launch your unmanned ship first. Of course, don't call it RS-5 anymore. You know, name TBD. But it will be something like that. And uh, this will be the basic cargo ship. Will be <laughs> what? You missed in the recording. The recording is not yet. Yeah, OK. Um, anyway. Uh, <laughs> You see, there are two, uh, two ships, um, and they are 26 months uh, separate, which is the synodic period I mentioned. They land on Mars, and they come back. And uh, the whole trip uh, takes 56 months, um, and it's very reasonable. There is nothing you can improve on it, basically. It's the same uh, approach von Braun used, and we all used in the 60s. It's, it's never changed in 60 years. Uh, we, we just you know, fiddle around with propulsion systems and uh, have better life support systems today. We have a better grip on reliabilities, on safety, of course. Uh, so masses have come down. Things don't have to be so heavy uh, with all what, what, what we have learned. But there are still a whole bunch of unknown things, um, which I've uh, pulled together here. Well, this is you know, what DR, DRA5 kind of had in mind a little bit. It's on their report, the picture, the title picture. Uh, this is essentially what we still need to do, uh, what is critical, um, transportation and propulsion, local resource utilization, cryogenic liquid gas systems, storage, for example, long-term storage, zero-G handling and transfer, EVA systems, um, which you protect against dust a lot, uh, long-lasting, lightweight, highly flexible spacesuits and gloves, lightweight and serviceable EVA life support system, regenerative life support systems, hopefully closed uh, cycles for most of what we need, um, surface habitats and building techniques, human health and productivity, zero-g adaptation and countermeasures, human factors, health maintenance, radiation protection, energy production and storage, regenerative fuel cells and surface nuclear power systems. Mars is further away from the sun, so we cannot really bank on solar electric power if we want to run um, ISRU um, uh, in situ resource utilization machinery there. We do need a nuclear uh, uh, energy source on, the, on, on Mars. Teleoperation and telerobotics, remote control operations, fine control manipulators, reduced operator training with the large distance. It takes like 20 minutes for a radio signal to come back to Earth. And then we have to react and send back our commands. It takes another 20 minutes. Uh, in that time, you know, they may have already driven uh, you know, or somehow made a mistake. So people, the crews have to be much more independent, uh, much more self um, uh, on the, and we can simulate that already on the ISS, uh, for example, by cutting down on communications and by putting more reliance, more uh, self-determination on crew members so that they don't have to rely on mission control centers all the time with every little bit and on our computers. So those are some typical things we can already simulate and the space station ISS uh, lends itself uh, in, a, in a tremendous way for a lot of these things which need zero g and also the psychology behind it you know of being locked up in space and doing certain things uh, planetary rovers uh, motor lubrication materials for long-term use dust control uh, advanced operational tasks automatic systems control systems management and scheduling and simulations and training maybe better virtual reality than we have so that is what where we need to do where we have have to get working 
And so if, if not much in the flight area happens in the next few years, this is really where the people put their brains and where they work behind the scenery and where things will be continuing uh, to go on. Um, this is, uh, before I uh, have a few words of conclusion, here are three nice quotes from visionaries. Uh, <coughs> no one can know what humans will find when they land on Mars. All that can be said with certainty is this, the trip can be made and will be made someday. That's what Werner von Braun said uh, to in Collier's magazine in 1954 um, in April edition. Secondly, the expedition to Mars should be seen as a crowning achievement of a stepwise and often painfully <laughs> slow development of human spaceflight, which may require many decades. Werner von Braun, 1956, in Frankfurt, uh, in the Paul's Cathedral. And then at the bottom, what seemed to be unrealizable for centuries, and yesterday was daring dream, now becomes a real challenge, but tomorrow an accomplishment. There are no barriers to human thought. Sergei Pavlovich Korolev, 1966, Pravda. So uh, I would fully support what they're saying, uh, but particularly the painfully slow uh, thing is something which uh, I think uh, he hit it right there. Uh, in conclusion, uh, in the US today, the RS-5, uh, the RS-1 may have bitten the dust, but a heavy lift vehicle named TBD is being studied. <laughs> Maybe we should call it TBD, you know. <laughs> Uh, you know, we call it the ISS, ISS, because nobody could, uh, could kind of find a good name for it. Anyway, so uh, a heavy lift vehicle named TBD is being studied for development. Orion is still alive in the form of the MPCV, and NASA-supported COTS efforts are underway to provide a crude launcher to take the place vacated by RS-1 besides the stalwart Soyuz. In looking back over 60 years of manned Mars mission studies, what can we see? The view shows, first of all, that by necessity, near-term oriented politics is ill-suited for deciding on such a far-sighted complex of questions. But visionary political leaders are necessary and will again raise our sights to more distant vistas. The demise of SEI and Constellation has not removed Mars from NASA's field of view, especially that of its advanced planners, who on the one hand see NASA's undisputed leadership and impetus-giving role in space science and space exploration as a moral obligation to future human ge generations, and who on the other hand realize how crucial for U.S. economy and strengths in aerospace and other key industries, it is to force technological advances, which in turn provide new development momentum. Multinational participation is increasingly desirable, not just for economic reasons, but more importantly for raising levels of mutual understanding, tolerance, and fearless interdependencies. This calls for a common cause on neutral, uncontested grounds. And space is probably the only such grounds we have, neutral and uncontested. The ISS, a shining demonstration of a common cause, has already brought 16 nations peacefully together over the past 11 years. Now we will need a new and bigger common cause with its, for uh, with its forces, and manned Mars provides it. The reasons why manned Mars are pretty straightforward. Looking, uh, first of all, looking for signs of former or present day life on a planet other than Earth. Second, studying Mars and its natural processes in history to become smarter about our own Earth. It's called comparative planetology. Thirdly, establishing a foothold for humans to eventually live on Mars. Fourth, providing us with a new source of economic returns and techno-scientific knowledge similar to the Apollo program. And five, last not least, 
using the challenge of this unique neighborly world as a common cause for Earth people to tackle together. When will we be ready for Project Humans to Mars? In addition to the social, political and uh, uh, financial readiness, it will require the development of specific technologies, which I've indicated there, such as aerobraking, cryogenic fuel storage and equipment, nuclear thermal and nuclear electric propulsion systems, photovoltaic and nuclear energy sources for the base operation, closed cycle life support systems, automatic information systems, scientific instruments, EVA systems, surface rovers and much more. Not in the least, it also requires substantial work on and in the present day ISS, which has evolved from relatively modest beginnings to a powerful and sophisticated international world-class research facility. All in all, to be able to conduct the Mars expedition in all its phases with a high degree of mission success probability, a technological capacity will be required which today is still far from accessible to us. But its mastery will open incredible new possibilities for tomorrow's humankind. At the most fundamental human level, those 60 years are telling me, are telling us here at NASA, if you are in the business of getting people to Mars, never give up. Thank you. Um, yeah, I'd be glad to take questions. Those I can answer, of course. <laughs> Anyone? Did I say any, uh, one, uh, anything that you don't agree with? Yeah, I, that's still an open issue. Uh, final word has not been said yet. It takes, uh, it takes uh, experiment, experimentation in situ, in space, in COG a lot. Um, you know, there are talks about actually putting a centrifuge on the ISS eventually. Um, I think this will be pursued. I know it's going on. And uh, uh, you either are able to uh, get away with living uh, in weightlessness all the time, uh, by doing your proper exercise. Uh, our uh, space station crew has to exercise two hours a day, which is pretty boring. And they just not have to you know, sit on one machine, they have to use several machines in order to get aerobics and anaerobics and so on. It's pretty sophisticated. And they have stayed up there for many months without any detrimental results, so it works. And one guy, uh, one, a Russian, Polyakov, Dr. Polyakov, has stayed there for the duration of a Mars flight in Mir and came back and is still jumping around. Uh, you know. So uh, I think that basically you may not need it, but we're not sure yet. That was a mistake. I, 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 I'm, you know, it's typically NASA. You know, in a naive way, um, the the guys there, the SEI guys, said, "Hey, uh, NASA, tell us how much it's going to cost." And so NASA, you know, being good soldiers, came up and uh, said, "Oh, it's about four hundred to five hundred billion." You know, uh, <laughs> sure. I mean, this, uh, you, you could have found a, find a different way. Sure, it would have cost that, but so what? I mean, over thirty years, and. You, you should include also the returns in the meantime. In those 30 years, you do get returns back. So it's not a closed uh, expenditure thing where you pull out 400 billion and give it away. It's investments, you know, with paychecks and, uh, and so on. So it's not throwing money out into space. But those decision makers uh, here at, uh, at, at in Washington kind of uh, were floored by it. And um, NASA always makes the same mistakes of not properly uh, telling um, 
you know, what, uh, what's what, and, and we, we are very bad in that area. We may be great scientists and engineers and, and program managers, but somehow we cannot properly explain what it is all about. Uh, who would, who, I mean, who in NASA would dare talking about common cause with Russia, you know? But I think it's something, or China, something, so these things need to be now faced up front. Otherwise, we'll, we won't go anywhere, in my opinion. So NASA should, uh, in my opinion, uh, learn from those past uh, naive mistakes where, you know, we try to, uh, you know, kind of be nice and and go back and iterate the shuttle all the way back down to what it is now. We, there were, were times when we probably could have stamped our foot and said, hey, wait a minute, uh, if you cut us even more with the shuttle, we are getting into dangerous areas, uh, but we never did. You know, we, we got through the solid boosters because they looked cheaper at the time and uh, uh, did away with um, most of the reusability, threw away, you know, the tanks and so on. The tank was supposed to be cheap, but it turned out to be about two billion or so uh, a piece uh, uh, later on. So all of those nice predictions were, were just pie in the sky. Back in the 50s, when he did that, that giant study, no, that he didn't attach any years to that. Uh, he went out and uh, made a cost estimate. I mean, this was all missile technology he used for a Mars expedition. I, I, imagine V2 engines, 12 of them in each, uh, boosting to Mars. There was no way he reasonably could have put any dollars to it. But he said it's going to cost about 10 Berlin airlifts. You know, that was... Uh, something people understood. So he went and said, hey guys, it may sound a lot, but look, I give you 10 ships. You know, it's a expedition, it's Earth, it's mankind doing it, and it's going to cost you about 10 Berlin airlifts. <laughs> oh yeah. Exactly. Exactly. I think uh, I think even even Reagan <coughs> realized pretty late then that the SDI didn't go anywhere, and all the scientists told him, "Hey, it's not going to work." A battle stations in orbit, and the Russians were already doing their own battle station development. So uh, this was a, a totally insane uh, idea, uh, which was kind of typically Hollywood. Uh, yeah. And so uh, what uh, Bush, who was the vice president at that time, when he became president, uh, he was pretty smart. I don't know who came up with the idea, but he said, okay, uh, that's great. We got all these industries now uh, fired up, workforce, everything. Is, everyone is doing SDI. Uh, why don't we just slightly shift it and make SEI out of it? It was much smart. And uh, it's so silly that this whole SEI went away. It was such a great idea and this 400 to 500 billion killed it the, the costing thing but it's essentially what will be done anyway the same with uh, the integrated program plan instead of doing things in parallel like Müller and von Braun wanted because of commonality we are doing the same things but in, sequen in sequence one after the other we are building a shuttle, we are building a space station and doing one after the other which, uh, of course, means every time we have to, have to go back to our drawing boards and start all over again instead of having commonality. You had no question, sir? No. No. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, any, any other questions? Dan? <laughs> no question? <laughs> I need that guy for my computer. 
Okay, thank you very much.